Welcome back to another episode of Card Talk, a podcast where we spend just a little bit of time talking about cards from Lord of the Rings, the card game. I'm your host, Dave Walsh. And I'm Grant Thompson, just along for the ride. <laughs> and Ted is not here to do his funny pun. Okay, but... well, I can change mine slightly. I'm not along for the ride today. I'm just along for the hunt. <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Ted. I mean, Grant. That's so good. Anyways, here we are, continuing on with our one show, one card format. And for those people who are interested in seeing all that we have to do for Card Talk, you can go over to our YouTube channel. We have over 400 videos posted over there. You can see our um, our our shows and our games and our extra content and all this crazy stuff over there. Um, make sure you subscribe. We're very close to a thousand as of the recording of this. So that'd be great to get over a thousand subscribers. And we also have an audio podcast. Make sure you subscribe and rate and review us, I guess, because we want to push our, push it up the algorithm. So not because we think we're great, but because we want to make sure that this resource is easily available to people that are um, looking for Lord of the Rings content. Um, we also have a blog. Uh, Matt over at the blog uh, keeps up with what we do every week by releasing a written review of what we do. So you can see the blog over at cardtalk2018.com. That'll be a lot of fun for uh, all you people that love to uh, read about the game and read about cards. We also have a new play series. Um, Micah and Ethan Quantz are doing Second Breakfast. So every other Sunday they are playing a scenario and they're building decks based on certain criteria that they have. And then they announce the criteria that they use to build the decks. And you can follow along uh, with them. You can build your decks. You can compare to what they did or you can just go and interact with them over there. But join them for our for Card Talk's second breakfast on Sunday. Every other Sunday is at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So you can do everything. Uh, you can do all the math there. And the last thing is we have a Patreon for people who are interested in supporting what we do. We keep the lights on here at the podcast and keep the live streaming coming and keeping the blog alive. Um, that all takes a couple a couple of bucks and we are happy that uh, we have patrons like you out there willing to do this in such an amazing community. If you're interested in uh, getting in on the swag train, uh, you have to become a patron by uh, the end of April. So April is the, is the cutoff. So um, if you don't, if you miss it, that's okay. You can always become a patron, but you have to become a patron at the $5 level and up before April. And you have to be continuously a patron through till October 1st, at least. Um, that's, that gets you eligible for the big swag. We give a little something out to everybody, but uh, we like to give our big swag out to those people who uh, give at least five bucks a month. Um, having said that, whew, Grant, yes. let's get into the card. What card are we going to be looking at today? It's actually one of my favorites. Well, we're going on a merry little hunt today. And uh, it's not so such a little hunt. It's the great hunt. <laughs> the three cost lore event from the Fates of Wilderland Adventure Park which reads, you must use resources from three different heroes' pools to pay for this card. Combat action, choose and discard a non-unique enemy in the staging area. Ooh, okay, well, before we dig into the card, Grant, where does this come from in the lore, or what is it representing <laughs> in the books? Well, as me and you just discussed, we... <laughs> We had to dig um, deep for this one. <laughs> yeah, we are gathering it um, roughly around chapter eight in the books where Bilbo and the dwarves are at or near Mirkwood Forest. And 
we are guessing it's the woodman going on a l- merry old hunt through the forest. <laughs> but right. the flavor text actually refers to um, they could hear uh, the noise of a great hunt, and if you read right before it, they talk about horns blaring, dogs baying, and things like that. So, so we're pretty sure that's not the elves doing that, and <laughs> we know it's not beyond doing that so the only other possibility would either be the wargs and orcs or the woodmen <laughs> right it's not spiders either so <laughs> yeah so it's got to be the woodmen i f- i think that that's a good thing and it's just a passing like one line in the in the book talking about you know what that they heard the hurt they heard the great hunt um, going on, and the dwarves tried to hunt the white deer that was coming through, and they missed. And Thorin was really grumpy that they missed, and now their bows were useless and stuff like that. So, does this card represent that scene? I mean, yeah, I could <laughs> say so. In in abstract sort of way, the art definitely. Um. The being grumpy about it, probably not because this card in itself is getting rid of an enemy in the staging area for you, so that would probably make you happy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that it's a little bit, it's a little bit sideways, but I think it's it's pretty it's, good representation of a great hunt, right? It's it's definitely obscure. <laughs> yeah it's an obscure reference to something that you want to really have happen when when you're playing this game right because you're yeah. engaging and or you're you have non-unique enemies happening all the time so um so what about the card though do you play this card do you like this card do you not like this card what's going on with it right yes i like this card um no i don't often play it um, and that's mainly because it's so restrictive. Mm-hmm. First of all, you've got to pay it from three heroes' resource pools, and then it's a non unique enemy in the staging area, which is highly restrictive, right. especially when you're playing in law. Because generally speaking, when you're in law, you've got quite high threat because most of the decent most of the law heroes that have got good start lines are quite high threat. So they're going enemies are going to be coming down to engage you. So me personally, the thing that would make this better um would be just to say discard a non-unique enemy in play rather than having that further restriction of it being up in the staging area. However, I do like this when you come to the Grey Haven's box. This right. card demolishes ships. Yes. <laughs> as long as it's non-unique ships, right? I mean, there's there's several non-unique ships, but I mean, that's it's good. This card you can great hunt ships right out right away, right? Like, yeah. It's uh, as long as it's not immune to player card effects. And a lot of those ships have high engagement costs too, if I'm remembering yep. correctly. I mean, I know that there's some that are low, but uh, you know, there's yes. just and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna tail off of what you said and say that like the the combat action restrictive has to be not engaged or has to be in the staging area. Also restrictive for what you're saying, you know, like a lot of times you want to engage these things and you want to bring them down and, you know, like that's how you're doing stuff and so for it to be a combat action. So something that's still in the staging area, that's sometimes challenging. But I think the most restrictive requirement is that you have to use three different heroes pools to pay for it. So it immediately you can't use it in a um, Grey Wanderer contract it takes a lot of setting up if you're going to use um, if you're going to use a like bond of friendship where you have four different heroes. Of course, I know that you can use the the song of travel, uh, sorry, the song of wisdom <laughs> to uh, to give your person a lore resource um, and, and 
and Gandalf has the lore resource if this were on top. So, like, I get that there's ways that you could do that, but, you know, the it's it's a challenge to to put together a deck that can run this reliably, I guess, is what, you know. That's if, not solely lore. That's not just a lore, right, straight up lore deck. That said, there's a lot of fun straight lore decks out there that could use this, and I think that this is really a uh, a, a really good solution for uh, lore decks that are the like the lore support deck in a multiplayer game. Oh, definitely. Right, like if you um, like, lore is known. Lore has a lot of great cards, like uh, a lot of the Ents are in lore. So, like, lore doesn't necessarily need help in uh combat but where lord needs help living is if you're if you're doing if you're running the healing card draw deck <laughs> and you need to be able to get rid of stuff you know it's like okay here we go we're gonna get rid of stuff and that's it's always good to do that um what i was about to say was it's also, you've got like things like a good tail, um, a good harvest that can also allow you to pay for this. But it's it's definitely easier if you're just playing a monosphere low deck to make this run reliably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, if you think about where you want enemies. Like you want them in well, maybe you don't want any. Let's let me rephrase the let me rephrase it. I you want a lot of people to be engaged with enemies, right? Well, <laughs> you, if for this card to work, you want them in the staging area, right? So yeah, like you want low threat if you're playing solo, or you know, you want to be you know not engaging people for the most part. Um, but you know, there's also decks that push people back into the staging area right i think about your classic done here duck shoot deck with fastrid pushing people back in the staging area so to add to add um this card to that deck would be a huge like you wouldn't do it right like the pushing no. people back into the staging area and attacking the staging area mechanic yeah, Haldir does it. So if you have Haldir, you know, like there's things that can do it, but done here and faster at pushing people back, like I don't know, it just doesn't really work out. Um, I think a lot of the pushing back is also in the spirit sphere, right? Pushing back to yeah. the staging area. Yeah, you've got um but this also works well if you're going up against Mumax. Right, because it's discard, it's not destroy yeah. or do damage or anything like that. Exactly. Right. It's and as far as I'm aware, the Mumax aren't unique. Yeah, I mean, Wraith on Wings, um, yep. <laughs> they're not unique and they're not immune to player card effects. So, I mean, there's lots of there's good lots targets. Of good targets for it. Um, you just got to have the lower threat to deal with it. Yeah. Now, that's probably where Milan, Pippin, and Falco come in. Right. I mean, you could oh my. you could run a whole bunch of things, oh. right? Like, oh, you could. I just do said a the dreaded. Deck. I just said the dreaded word. Merlon. Merlon. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. In my version of Octagon, Merlon is Spirit um, Aragorn because I, when Spirit Aragorn was spoiled, I used I I, I created a proxy and I never changed it because I never use Merlon. <laughs> um, but I mean, there's a ton of, you could even use um, uh, uh, King, Messenger, M-O-T-K, Messenger of the King. Yep. Messenger of the King Furial is lore, which, according to the the community, Furial is the best Messenger of the King ally, right? So that's in Sphere. But I mean, if you're doing that tricksy lore thing, this is, I think, a good deck to have in there to be able to deal uh, damage to, yeah. or to be able to get rid of <laughs> difficult enemies. I was uh, building a encounter scrying deck that used cards like Farsighted and Risk Some Light and Denethor and you know Out of the Wild so that like you're only picking which cards you want to play. Like 
you're choosing how the game is getting played from the encounter deck. It didn't quite work out perfectly, and I'm still it's still always in the back of my mind. But this card is a is a is great for that because you know I'm I'm reducing my threat. Um, I'm able to play this card because I do have some spirit in there, but like I, I am using um, the songs and good harvest to, to be able to play these uh, th- these cards that require three different lore heroes and things like that. So this card is actually specifically has inspired me to build uh, some decks. So it's pretty good. I, I really like this card a lot i have a feeling we're going to be seeing it too it's not it's not been released in any of the um i don't think no it was not it was not released in any of the starter decks but i think that my guess is we're going to see the arid mithrin cycle released as the first cycle hits and so i'm recording this on march 13th i may be completely wrong but We'll find out. <laughs> so you heard it here for first, folks. Yeah. David got it wrong. <laughs> yeah, you know when they heard it first is when we did episode number one that I was wrong. I've been wrong for many, many years. Uh, don't say that, buddy. <laughs> so, are there like specific combos that you run with this card? Like, is there um, ranger that... spikes? Okay, yeah, trap deck. This works great in a in a, a deck that. Yep. Yeah. And to your point, it doesn't have to be just a trap deck. It could just be your runner ranger spikes. But yep. yeah, um, anything that can hold enemies in the staging area, regardless of threat. Um, mm-hmm. so maybe even running going up against um intruders in Chetwood where you ideally don't want to leave enemies in a staging area, this right. card would work really well in. Is uh, the orc war party just can't have attachments? It's not It's not unique. And maybe maybe it's... I don't think it's immune to player card effects either. So that's a good... That's a really good one because you can't win the game unless, you know, unless there's no copies of orc war party in, the, in play. So... Uh, Orc War Party is not unique. It cannot have attachments. Right, it just can't. Have and while Orc War Party is in the staging area, enemies in the staging area cannot take damage. Right, but this doesn't damage them. So this is even uh, good tech around that one. So that's great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so this is this is good. This is a good learning for some of the new players. This says discard. So there's a difference between discard, damage, destroy. You know, all those D words, you know, when some, when a card gets destroyed, that means it's taken more damage than it's, than it's health. A uh, card that's damaged just has, you know, has some damage put on. Uh, yeah. Just some, uh, some damage tokens on it. And then a card that's discarded is just put in the, um, it doesn't get destroyed. It just gets removed from play and put in the discard pile. So lots of different triggers going on there. Yeah, I think that there. I think this. I I love this card, but it's definitely not. It's not used all the time. <laughs> I think it's just real. Uh, it's too restricted. Yeah, it's it's real restricted, like you said. If so. if it was just, um, even if they lightened the restriction a little bit, where it's like not an enemy in the staging area, or only pay from one hero's resource pool you could possibly get around the other restrictions that the cards put in place but with so many restrictions it's like well is it really worth me playing this card over say something else yeah and I mean, when when it comes down to that, you've got to look at your quest. So I've just mentioned um, in Shooters and Chetwood, this is a great card for that quest. Mm-hmm. Great tech for it. Yeah. Because enemies do not come, do not make engagement checks against you in that quest. Any any of the main sailing quests from the Grey Havens and the um, 
following adventure cycles is a good um that has ships in it is probably a good idea to have this in because mm-hmm. a lot of those ships have high engagement costs as we've already said right. and there's probably um in Ophelian where you have that Mumak mm-hmm. coming at you great card to deal with the Mumak I was thinking if you go back and revisit Journey Along the Anduin and you want to get rid of the Hill Troll first round Super yeah easy, another right? <laughs> another one if you've got low enough threat for it right and that's the well. If you're playing lore, you probably do, unless you're running like Treebeard, Elrond, or something. But you know, lore, lore is that sphere, right? <laughs> that you can do that. Yeah, but like I say, um, there's ways and means around using this card, and generally speaking, it's going to make an impact on your table. And if it doesn't, you've either waited too long to play it. Or um, you're dead anyway. So, <laughs> right. Just as a quick aside, there is another um, card that requires you to have all lore heroes, and it actually says um, you can only play it if each hero you can control has the printed lore sphere, and that's Advanced Warning. So, Great Hunt plays off of Advanced Warning, which is a two cost lore event that says until the end of the phase enemies do not make engagement checks so (laughs) like you play advanced warning nobody engages you and then you can play great hunt and then you can um put (laughs) and then you can great hunt away whatever enemy you want and then you can use the Squirrel of Isildur, which pulls one of those events back into your to hand. To recur it. To recur it. Like, I mean, there's there's some fun potential there, right? Like, for, you know, if you want to be tricksy. That's, and that's what lore is. It's all just tricksy stuff, you know? It's yeah. Um, it brings to mind the three costs for um, the Great Hunt puts me in mind of the three costs for Thicket of Spears in Tactics from the core set. Three costs must be paid from each individual hero. (laughs) And again, Thicket of Spears is very restrictive and that probably leads less to playability overall than having it universally open. Right. And don't get us wrong, like I say, this card is generally impactful when it's able to get played. But up until you get the chance to play it, it's a dead card. (laughs) Yep. That's... Yeah, it's not... This card is not... You have to build around you know some cards you just kind of slot in and it works and it's fine but this card you actually have to intentionally um build around and i think it's priced it's it's priced that way right like it's three yeah. cost which is a cost but then it's also you know got all these restrictions that you talked about which is also a cost to some degree because you need to make sure you're able to play it so i mean that's yeah the, the only thing the only thing it's missing is exhaust each hero <laughs> right, like your hero's the one that's uh, like uh, attacking the the white deer as it runs through the woods, right? Yeah. Well, what do you think of the art of this card? I like it. Yeah, I think it's a nice looking bit of art. This is like super photorealistic to, in my book. Like when you when you zoom in on it, it it gets a little less. But uh, I think that this moment where the dwarves are looking at this white deer run past. Like, I just think it's really great. I love the the beams of light coming through the forest. You know, I, there's some butterflies in the background. Like, this is this is the kind of art that people play the game for, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not, like, the subject of the art isn't, you know, particularly Tolkien, right? This could be any nature art that's out there, but this is the quality of art that people play the game for right yeah and so it'd be great if this was art that was based on like bayorn or something you know like 
some other woodmen, but you know, it's Carlos did a great job with the artwork on this. <laughs> Carlos, Carlos Palma Cruchaga. Yeah, I didn't even want to try and pronounce his surname. Sorry about that. Because I didn't want to bunch I didn't want to butcher it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So well, should we ring this guy? Sure, let's ring the Great Hunt. Okay, so for anybody who doesn't know or may have been tuning in for the first time or has forgotten, uh, we have a highly scientific yet arbitrary system of rating a car on a scale from one to ten where one ring is the one card to rule them all, or one of the best cards in the game, and ten rings is the card that we throw back into the fiery chasm from whence it was made. So, Grant, the Great Hunt, where would you rank it? I'm going to rank it a five, because it's definitely quest-specific in my mind, because of all the ro- those restrictions. It's deck-specific because of all the restrictions but when it does get played it generally makes an impact so five rings for me okay i'm gonna go out on a limb here and i don't think i've ever done this in the history of the show four and a half years we've been rating cards ringing them talking about them but i love this card and it inspires me to build decks and that's really what i look at at a card yes of course it has to be useful and things like that but like i have tried to and successfully put this card in decks all around the plate like so not because of its usefulness uh sorry not because of its you know like well yeah because of its usefulness or its ease of being able to slot into decks but merely on its in, inspiring me to put this card into decks, despite me not having a ton of decks with this card in it. But based on that alone, I'm going to give this card a three. Because <laughs> I just think this card just really, I was almost going to give it a two. I was like, oh, I just really love this card. It's like, it's it, it just, it just wets that lore whistle to me like this is what lore does doesn't doesn't hit anything straight on it's like hey you know if you got a couple of things working in your advantage use the great hunt (laughs) so so that's it um to all our patrons out there thank you so much for um helping us keep the lights on here at the podcast and if you guys want to become a patron links right here and um thank you to everybody for paying attention and we will see you all next week have a great day do you love the content here's what you can do to stay connected become a patron the money collected through patreon goes into keeping the lights on here at the podcast we love our patrons and you can join at many different levels visit patreon.com slash card talk 2018 you can subscribe to us whether you're watching our youtube channel or you're listening to us in your favorite podcatcher. Hit the subscribe button to get notifications of all our new episodes. Didn't know we were an audio podcast? Find us by searching Card Talk to get access to our 120 plus regular episodes. Didn't know we were a video channel? Find us by searching Card Talk L O T R L C G on YouTube. And there you can find not only our regular episodes, but you can find our bonus playthroughs and other content related to the game. Want to get a hold of Ted, Grant, or myself? Feel free to email the podcast at cardtalk2018 at gmail.com.